happy to have Marcelo Mendes Descolzi. He did his PhD in Stony Brook in 2012, actually in mathematics, and then moved to Vanderbilt. And I think the physics paper started only appearing a few years ago, but then, of course, we're very happy to have him talk here about physics and uh, he'll present about uh, general relativistic viscous fluids. Thanks. Okay, just maybe switch this. Okay, so um, thanks uh, the organizer for the invitation and the audience for being here. So different bits of what I'm gonna say today are joint work with different people, Fabio Benfica, Jameson Graber, Vu Huang, George Noronha, Maria Rados, Casey Rodriguez, and Yan Jen Shao. So, oops. So I guess the first slide is uh, known to everyone. So I'm just gonna use this to fix my notation, my terminology. We are looking at uh, viscous fluids described by an energy momentum tensor. So here my notation rho is the density, P is the equilibrium pressure, U is the velocity, and the velocity is of course normalized uh, by negative one. So my convention for the metric is mostly plus signs. G is the space-time metric with a covariant derivative nabla, and a big pi is the projection onto the orthogonal of U. And the, the main actor here are the viscous fluxes, which are the viscous correction to the energy density, the viscous correction to the equilibrium pressure, the heat flow, and the viscous shear stress. So pretty much everything I'm gonna say can be generalized to the case of uh, when you have a conserved a baryon current, I can include the J, but for simplicity, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. And of course, you also understand, want to understand divergence of t equals zero when that's coupled to Einstein equations. So let's see. Uh, and if you want to define your theory, what you need to do, you need to define what the viscous fluxes are. And in the standard, there are kind of you no know, two main philosophies that people use. One is a derivative expansion, where you say that the viscous fluxes are given in terms of the hydrodynamic variables, in this case, the density and the velocity, and they are derivatives. So the equations of motion are just divergence of t equals zero, possibly coupled to Einstein equations. And each viscous flux is a known expression in u, rho, and their derivatives. Now in this talk, we're gonna only consider derivative expansions up to first order. So we're gonna consider only first order theories, meaning that we're gonna look at uh, derivative expansions where the viscous fluxes involve uh, only first order derivatives of the hydrodynamic variables. And then another possibility uh, that people also use a lot is uh, extended theories where the viscous fluxes are treated on the same footing as rho and u, so they are new variables. And of course, if you are including new variables, then you have to supplement your equations of motion by new equations of motion satisfied by the viscous fluxes. So this is, again, known to the, this audience. Examples of first order theories would be the landau lifshitz and the Ecker theory. Uh, and examples of extended theories would be like the israel stewart theories. And I put in plural here because of course, israel stewart can be used to refer to different theories, right? Uh, and I'm just gonna collective call all of them Israeli student theories. And if you want more details on the statements, I can tell you specific which equations of motion we are using. Another example of extended theories would be uh, the anisotropic hydrodynamics. Okay. So when you are defining your theory, there are some properties you'd like uh, to have. Uh, and this is gonna uh, tie nicely with uh, what Professor Larry was saying in the previous talk. So you want, of course, this is a relativistic theory. So you want consistency with relativity. You want your evolution to be causal. You want some for, for a form of stability because I have dissipative effects. So here we require that the linear perturbations about global equilibrium decay in time, or at least they do not go on time. And for simplicity by global equilibrium, I'm gonna uh, define it to be states where the density and the velocity are constant and the viscous fluxes vanish. Uh, as you know, the global equilibrium is something slightly more general than that. You can look at uh, things with a killing field, right? When u divided by t is a killing field. But let's take the case where the hydrodynamic variables are constant just for simplicity. Uh, 
So of course you want to have a well-defined initial value formulation, uh, which means that the equations of motion need to be locally well posed. Again, just tying with what Professor Larry was saying. Uh, so what do we mean by well posed? Uh, means that to give initial data, there exists a unique solution to the nonlinear equation of motion defined for some time. Uh, so sometimes people also add to the definition of local opposites continuous depends on the data, but that's not gonna play any role on what I'm gonna say today. Now, you actually want consistency with general relativity, which means that you know everything that I'm talking about causality and local opposedness should also hold when the equations of motion are coupled to Einstein equations. Okay, so those are all natural requirements. Uh, and when it comes to specific to numerically simulate Einstein equations coupled to matter, in our case, the Einstein fluid equations, uh, we want to have some good three plus one decomposition of the equations of motion. By this, I mean, you wanna have some decomposition which are adapted to the kind of numerical uh, schemes, the numerical algorithms that people in the numerical relativity use. Uh, and one uh, key property that appears here to help ensure this is uh, that of strong hyperbolicity. You would like to have equations of motion that are strongly hyperbolic. And finally, uh, there's a thermodynamic requirement um, that we would like to have entropy production to be non-negative. So we have this kind of very long list of requirements uh, and then you can ask, uh, can we satisfy them? What is actually known for the standard theories? So let me just remind you of some things that are known. Again, this is probably old story for this audience, but uh, we know that a, a large class of first order theories is acausal and unstable. And this class of first order theories, in fact, includes uh, the Eckert and Landau Lifshitz theories. And what is behind this uh, instability and lack of causality results is that the equations of motion turn out not to be hyperbolic. Uh, now, for Israel Stewart, uh, some good things happen. Uh, we know that the, this theory is stable. And if you look at the linearization about global equilibrium, which means if you look at the linearization about these states where density and velocity are constant and the viscous fluxes vanish, then this linearized evolution is known to be causal. So uh, a little more is known actually about causality. Causality has been proven in one plus one dimensions and in rotational symmetry. So we have all these good features for the israel stewart uh, equations. But of course, these uh, properties leave open some questions. If we we'll go back to our list of requirements in the previous slide. Uh, so what about local opposedness for the Israel Stewart equations and causality in three plus one dimensions, which means in physical space. And here, of course, I'm referring to local opposedness as a causality of the nonlinear theory and outside symmetry classes, outside rotational symmetry or axis symmetry, things like that. Uh, in this regard, let me guess, emphasize that uh, the standard causality that we see uh, in the literature is for the linearization of the equations and not the linearization about arbitrary states, the linearization about the global equilibrium, which is important thing you're linearizing about states where this cause divergences. We also don't know uh, if uh, the Israel Stewart equations in general uh, are a strong hyperbolic system. Uh, so that's something we would like to do as to, to know as well. Uh, and even though we have this uh, uh, instability and a causality results for first order theories, uh, of course, that does not rule out that every first order theory has to be bad. So we would like to know if you can construct a good first order theories where good means like theories that are causal, stable and have a well-defined initial value formulation. Okay, so the idea is that, of course, the goal is to understand the nonlinear evolution, try to answer these questions. But unfortunately, the nonlinear evolution uh, is too complicated, right? So that's one reason why it's very uh, common to look at the linearized equations and linearize about some special state, which is the linearized about states where the viscosity vanishes. That's something very natural to do. Uh, even though, uh, unfortunately, that's not going to give you full information about the nonlinear dynamics. Uh, this is probably known, but I think it doesn't hurt to illustrate this with a simple example. 
So suppose you have an evolution equation like this. So this is gonna be a nonlinear wave equation with a nonlinear propagation speed given by psi minus one squared. And of course, if you want this to be causal, you want the speed of propagation to be bounded by one. So you'd like uh, psi to be between zero and two. So we have this evolution equation and here you have a condition for causality. On the other hand, if you look at this evolution equation and if you linearize about what would be the equilibrium in this problem, let's say the equilibrium is the zero solution. So if you linearize about zero, uh, you get simply the plane linear wave equation, which is always causal, of course. So there is no way you would be able to find this causality constraint for the nonlinear evolution by looking only at the linearization. Uh, and this is a simple example, but the point is that something very similar happens in Israel Stewart. If you just look at the linearized equations about the global equilibrium, that's not going to give you all the information you need to characterize when the states are causal or not. Now, if you want to really talk about uh, causality in the nonlinear regime, maybe I should uh, make precise what I mean by that. So let me uh, give you the definition of causality. So if you consider a system of PDEs for an unknown phi would be a system of equations. Uh, this could be nonlinear equations. They are defined in a globally hyperbolic space-time. And you assume it to have initial data given on a Cauchy hypersurface that I'm calling sigma. So you say that this system is causal if for any x in the future of sigma, you can do for the past as well, but I'm taking here for simplicity only the future, the values of your solution depend only on the causal past of this point intersection with uh, the Cauchy surface sigma. So the D is the following. So look at a point x in our space time, and then you can look at the causal past of x. The causal past is depicted in this blue picture. is essentially the set of all points that can be connected to x with, via a causal curve, all points in the past. So if you're doing this in Minkowski space, the causal path would be simply uh, the bottom part of the light cone, right? Given by these dotted lines. But in a general hyper, uh, global hyperbolic space time, uh, you have curvature. So your cone is gonna look like a curved cone that I depicted by curving this picture. And then the solution at this point has to depend only on the data in this uh, blue disk. Anything that's happening outside is not causally connected to this point, so it cannot influence the value of the solution at that point. Uh, and that's a general definition that holds, you know, uh, in, uh, even for nonlinear equations, right? Just it talks about the values of the solution at a point. This definition uh, actually agrees with what you do in the linear analysis when you just look at the uh, abound for the modes, for the Fourier modes. But of course, uh, this idea of looking at the Fourier modes only works for equations that are linear and have constant coefficients. More generally, you have to look at a notion like this. Now, if you want to understand the causality, uh, what you need to do, you need to understand the system's characteristics. And again, this ties to, to things that Professor Lehrer was saying before. Uh, so essentially, uh, I'm not going to give you the technical definition of characteristics, but you can think like this. The same way you can define the causal path of a point using a Lorentzian metric, it is possible to define the causal path using a differential operator. So if you have a, a system of PDEs without reference to a metric, you can still define what the causal path of a point is, but it has a causal path whose structure is given by the differential operators in your equation. Uh, and then uh, the same notion of, uh, uh, applies, we'll have the causal path of a point, and the boundary of the set is going to be what we call the characteristics. And to say that the system is causal, then, the sense that we want in general relativity means that the causal path defined in the sense of Lorentzian geometry agrees with the causal path defined using the differential operator. Uh, so that's for causality, and as I said, we also want local opposedness. So we want to obtain equations of motion that are hyperbolic, and then apply techniques from hyperbolic PDs to try to prove something like existence in uniqueness of solutions. And everything that I said uh, has to work with or without coupling to Einstein equations, right? So both for the uh, evolution, nonlinear evolution equation just of the fluid, or when you couple to Einstein equations. 
Okay, so I can now uh, state uh, our first result, which can be stated as follows. So the Israeli Stewart equations are causal, uh, and the Cauchy problem is locally well posed in a class of function spaces called Givre spaces. And if you look at the simplified case where you don't have heat flux or shear stress, then this local well posedness actually holds in Sobolev spaces. So all these results hold with or without coupling twice in equations. And again, I want to emphasize this is a result for the equations in the full nonlinear regime. So for the complete set of equations. Okay. Uh, and of course, when I say that these Rev Stewart equations are causal, there are some hypotheses, some assumptions, but they, uh, in, I can uh, give you the reference later for what the precise assumptions are, but they are all very physically natural assumptions. Okay, so uh, I'm just stating the theorem in a sort of no short version here, because I'm not gonna give all the technical assumptions. Now I mentioned these uh, two spaces, Gevre spaces and Sobolev spaces. Uh, Gevre spaces are uh, essentially uh, a generalization of an analytic function, right? So are functions that have a certain control growth on their derivatives. And Sobolev functions are functions that have all the derivatives up to a certain order to be uh, square integrable. Now, the interesting Sobolev function is that uh, typically when you look at the many of the numerical schemes out there in the literature, in the numerical analysis community, they are typical schemes uh, that are tailored for equations that are locally well posed in Sobolev spaces. So those, those are schemes whose convergence, stability properties are tailored to equations that have a local well posed theory in Sobolev spaces. So that's one reason why we care about local well posed Sobolev spaces, because those theories typically uh, are good, or at least are not that bad for numerical simulations. Okay, so let me say a few words about how we prove this result. Uh, the causality uh, boils down just to compute the system characteristics. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that, but this is the main step to find the characteristics. But uh, of course, if you look at the Israel Stewart equations, uh, that problem is basically intractable by brute force, right? The equations are just too complicated to do a direct computation of the characteristics. So what we did, uh, we essentially we think geometrically, we have developed some calculation techniques that are uh, guided by some underlying geometry of the problem. And this underlying geometry is very much inspired by the notion of acoustical metrics, which is a geometric notion that appears in the case of the ideal fluid. Okay, so there is some geometric uh, slant to this proof. Then local opposedness, uh, that's done uh, using some uh, techniques of weakly hyperbolic systems that go back to the work of Leray and Omiya in the 60s. Then it's a long story. We have to use the ray spaces and you can simplify things if we have Sobolev spaces and so on. Uh, I'm not gonna bother you uh, with the technical details. Okay, so, uh, so the message here is that now Israel Stewart uh, had all the good properties we already knew, and now uh, we show that it's causal and has some uh, relatively uh, known local opposing theories, either in Gevray space or Sobolev spaces, so that's all very good. But uh, we should keep in mind some potential limitations of Israel Stewart. Uh, one potential limitation is that uh, actually uh, our result for nonlinear causality uh, does not apply. I mean, we, uh, so in the case where we have conserved currents, we don't know that what happens in that case. We also don't know if the result holds uh, in the presence of vorticity, or assumptions do not cover when you have an explicit dependence on the vorticity uh, in the equation for the, the viscous fluxes. Uh, of course, we'd like to have a general local opposing Sobolev spaces. We got only in a particular case, uh, and we still don't know if the equations are strongly hyperbolic. Okay, which is uh, something important for numerical simulations. Uh, another limitation of Israel Stewart that uh, actually you can show that Israel Stewart in general, the equations are not able to describe shocks in the sense that if you look at uh, shocks in one plus one dimension, if you assume that you have a shock in one plus one dimension, uh, you cannot find physically acceptable solutions. So all these are motivations for looking for alternative theories other than Israel Stewart. So uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about alternatives 
But before I, I, I get to that, let me just really quick make a comment about this result on shocks. This result, of course, uh, is a result by Garrick Lindblom and then redirected by Olson Hiscock, uh, that essentially uh, says that if you assume that the shock in one plus one dimension form is, exists, then uh, that solution cannot be physical. But they did not show that a shock actually happens. So that's the quantity of the next theorem, uh, which is a breakdown result for Israel Stewart, which can be stated as follows. We show that there exists an open set of smooth initial data for the Israel Stewart equations, for which the corresponding unique smooth solution to the Cauchy problem breaks down in finite time. So that means that in finite time, the solution either becomes singular or becomes unphysical. And unphysical here means that the dominant energy condition is violated. Uh, and such data actually is not something exotic that co corresponds to some localized perturbations of constant states. Okay. Um, the proof of this, uh, I'm not going to go into details. So let me just make it follow some standard ideas, but ultimately it's approved by contradiction. And I'm going to facilitate this approved by contradiction because being approved by contradiction, it actually does not reveal the nature of the singularity. It doesn't tell exactly what goes wrong. It just says that something has to go wrong. Uh, but still, this is, as far as we know, the first breakdown result for Israel Stewart equations. So we think this can actually open the door for the study of problems of shock formation. Okay, so let me move on. Uh, so the last uh, two or three minutes that I have, uh, I just want to uh, talk about possible alternatives to Israel Stewart equations. Uh, is a set of equations that has already appeared in this, uh, in this conference, in this workshop, which became known as the BDNK theory, which is essentially a generalized first order theory defined by these viscous fluxes. Okay, so the viscous fluxes are defined in this way. Uh, so here you have some coefficients tau and beta, which are known functions of the density. You think of the taus essentially as relaxation times. So of course, this is very complicated, right? So why do we need to do something so complicated? Uh, you need that to essentially fix the causality and instability problems of Ecker and landau lifshitz theories. So the way you, you should think, or at least the way that I think of um, the BDNK theory is as a fix to Landau and landau lifshitz and Ecker. So let's say landau lifshitz and Ecker are the natural things that you'd like to do but you can't because they're not causal, they're not stable. So you fix them by choosing the viscous fluxes in this form. And the reason why you need the viscous fluxes to be that complicated is that the basic philosophy here is the following. Uh, the fundamental principle should be the principle of causality. Causality should be the principle that dictates which terms are allowed in your theory and not the other way around. Not that you, you start to make some choices for your, your viscous fluxes and try to prove later on that things are causal. So ca causality should be the guiding principle. And if you use causality as the guiding principle, you arrive at some terms that have more or less this form. So then I can state the next result. Uh, the BDNK equations are causal and stable. The Cauchy problem is locally well posed in Sobolev spaces. The equations of motion can be formulated as a strongly hyperbolic system. And all these results hold with or without coupling to Einstein equations. And again, I emphasize the results for the full nonlinear theory. Okay. Uh, the proof uh, is uh, again the causality part is similar to what we did for Israel Stewart. You have to think geometrically. The stability is more complicated, but we use for the stability some general stability theorem that we proved in the paper that we hope can also be applied to some other systems. It's some general statement about stability. Uh, and the local opposedness, well, that's a long story, somewhat technical. Let me just say that we have to deal with some uh, typical technicalities that appear in the study of quasi linear equations. And for that, we have to use the calculus of pseudo differential operators. Uh, finally, uh, from the very beginning, I was saying everything was without uh, baryon current, but this result actually works uh, if you include a baryon current. Okay, so you can also consider the case where you have a dependence of the pressure on the uh, baryon number uh, and you have the conservation of J. 
OK, so that's a, a very nice result for BDNK theory. Uh, you, can, you might ask, what is the physical significance of all this? Uh, so the BDNK theory has some uh, good physical properties as well. Entropy production is something that's uh, non-negative in the limit of validity of the theory. That's something that is very well explained in the paper by Kovtun. Uh, the tensor is actually derivable from kinetic theory in some important specific limits. So if you look at the barotropic case, for example, we can derive the energy momentum tensor from kinetic theory. Uh, we did some test case simulations for the case of conformal fluids, which is the Bjork and the Gubser flow, and they reproduce what we expect in the case of these specific examples. Uh, although realistic numerical simulations have not been done yet for uh, applications of the BDNK theory in heavy ion collisions. Uh, and finally, um, uh, let me say that the linear theory is essentially the same as Israel Stewart theory in the sense that we have hydro and non hydro modes, and we have a Green's function that has a pole structure very similar to the Green's function of Israel Stewart. So the punchline is that uh, the BDNK theory has all the good features of Israel Stewart plus a good local poison theory in Sobolev spaces and a strongly hyperbolic formulation. And again, I emphasize this is all valid in the nonlinear regime with Riddell coupling to Einstein equations. So these features are good well poison in Sobolev spaces and strong hyperbolicity are lacking for Israel Stewart. Uh, but those are features that in general you want if you are interested in applications to neutral star mergers because of all the subtleties of numerically solving Einstein equations coupled to matter. Okay, I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, I'm going to stop here. And then the slides are going to be posted later on. So everything that I said, here are the specific references for all those results. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, Masut is first questions and discussion. All right, thanks. Uh, I have a question about, about the power counting that is used to Prove that the uh, second law holds, mm -hmm. second law thermodynamics holds. Um, imagine that we are solving the equation. We are solving the d mu, t mu, mu equals to zero. So we are not going to use this power counting there. Well, I, th I think I use the power counting like in the sense that, uh, so if you look at the uh, so if you look at the, the entropy current, right? So, so the entropy current is something involved, let's say U, okay? And then you look at the divergence. So it's gonna involve divergence of U. So that point, you wanna dis discard everything that's involving uh, second order terms, right? So the point I think is that you want to keep the order uh, in whatever you are kind of measuring, let's say the, 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 the entropy production at the same order that you have in your basic definitions, right? So that's different than when you look at the divergence of t min u equals zero, because there, uh, well, the equations of motion are divergence of t min u equals zero. It's not like you just start with something and you are comparing with, uh, with uh, a previous point that has no derivative of u at all, right? So I think, yes, I think that's the sense that you have to make the, the power counting uh, count. You know I, what I mean? I mean that uh, this is a bit confusing when you use the power counting in some one part that is uh, finding the mu as mu as mu, and the other uh, part that is you are solving the equations of motion and you are writing the t mu nu. You are not using the same power counting. Well, that, uh, but that there is no power counting involved in the t mu. The variance to mu equals zero. That's just those are just the equations of motion, right? No. So that's just, so. Uh, but uh, okay, so. Uh, are you going to be in the afternoon discussion? Maybe, maybe, maybe we can go over the calculation more detail. I, I think it's more useful than me just saying words. Then I can pull up yeah, the, uh, the calculation uh, and you can Maybe we can talk later about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's question. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, but I will be brief. So in, in your slide, you say that you have some poly structure that is similar um, to um, if I to our theory. However, yeah. you, you also say that uh, you have a setup uh, which can be derived uh, uh, from kinetic theory. And in kinetic theory in general, uh, 
the contributions, uh, there are like two contributions, poles and branch codes. So uh, if I try to derive your PDNK theory by using mm -hmm. kinetic theory, I will be hesitant to believe that only the poles will contribute there. Can you comment on that? Well, I, I think the crucial thing here is like uh, that you have to look at the matching conditions, right? So, uh, so the matching no, conditions No, but the matching here, conditions are not related with pole structure, I mean. No, but they're, they're related to how we derive things from kinetic theory, right? Okay. So, so and, and I think, uh, I think that's the, 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 the thing, like the matching conditions you have to use, they do not are uh, Landau or, uh, or, or Eckert choices, right? I think that's, that, that was the, uh, that the key ingredient that uh, lets you derive these equations from kinetic theory. That's something that also, was mentioned uh, in this workshop before, uh, I think in a Danny Cole's talk uh, that came up. And, uh, but, but the, the, the thing is like for some reason that uh, many people here probably understand better, uh, when you do the derivation of kinetic theory for Israel Stewart, uh, you, you have the same freedom. You didn't have to use Landau or Ecker, but you, 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 you do, and you end up with something that is causal and uh, stable and so on. And here, somehow, if you, stick to uh, Landau or Eckert, you're going to end up with a theory that's a-causal and unstable, right? Uh, right, but, so but when, you do, when you do kinetic theory, you use a collisional kernel. Yes. And the collisional kernel is not only relaxation time. Relaxation time is a model. If you mm -hmm. really go to the original Boltzmann equation or uh, recent developments where you have like QCD weekly copper theories, uh, you have diffusion of momenta from different mm -hmm. uh, sectors. And that's what I meant, like you don't have contributions only from the poles, you have other branch codes that play a role there. And that's mm -hmm. why uh, I am just confused that you say that, uh, that, that, I mean, I have not seen the paper, so I would like to see that later on, but I'm just confused right. that what do you do with the, with, in order to truncate all those contributions because the distribution function in kinetic theory is, uh, uh, is much more than just the uh, small gradients or any other type of, uh, uh, mm -hmm. approximation that you do to the solution. Maybe I can make a comment here, a quick comment about this. So Mauricio, uh, I think the Green's function that he's referring to that uh, there is the one, you know, just imagine that you have your hydro theory, your T mu nu, and you do a perturbation uh, with a metric, and then you find what are the sort of the Green's functions from that. In that case, you just have a standard thing, just like you have in Israel Stewart. That's what I'm saying, that the type of poles that will appear will be very similar. The, the actual problem that you go to kinetic theory and try to find what is actually, for example, the linearized collinear operator, what are the eigenvalues and things like that, then of course it will depend on the actual interactions and the actual... Uh, um, yeah, exactly. That, that was my question. So that, that of course will, will depend. So if you put something complicated there, it'll be some, some mess. I think yeah, the that's... point... I think it's clear for you now, right? Yes, 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 yes. That, yeah. that was maybe, I was maybe, I should, maybe I should define what I meant by the Green's function. Yeah, no, no, that, that's great. Thanks for clarifying. I was just confused by that, but thanks. Mm. Several other questions. I think Travis is next. Hi, right, thanks. Um, I just had a question. I don't know, maybe you won't want to answer it, but I was wondering if, if you, in your opinion, there is like physics that, or if you believe that there's physics that's mutually exclusive between BDNK and IS type theories, like edge sort type theories, like for instance, um, the, independent, the independent dynamic uh, degree of freedom in IS type theories, does that capture some sort of physics that BDNK, type, uh, BDNK wouldn't be able to capture or something like oh, that? that? That's a very good question, right? Uh, so we actually don't know, uh, the general, general sense that you don't know, but you would expect there would be some difference. You can see, for example, just from the initial conditions, right? So one thing that people like to do in numerical simulations take as initial conditions, some, some given energy momentum tensor, which corresponds to energy momentum tensor times zero, and then you match those, those components to what uh, the P mean U and so on are gonna be, right? Now for BDNK theory, since you cannot do that. In general, uh, you know, you have less degrees of freedom because you have like only the only U rho and the time derivatives, right? Or possibly if you include the baryon density. So in general, you're not gonna be able to match with, uh, with an arbitrary given uh, energy momentum tensor. So, so in that, that sense, there, there might be some different physics there, but uh, on the other hand, you can say that, okay, you can, maybe you cannot match BDNK exactly to a given T mu nu, but uh, maybe you can match up to something that's very small that you're gonna ignore anyway. Uh, 
Uh, but I think I, I, I think only running realistic numerical simulations you can actually answer that question. Uh, I'll be very hesitant to give a yes or no without actually uh, looking at this more carefully. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And then I think and the chat, Luis has a question. Uh, uh, yes. So thank you, Marcelo. Just two quick questions, if um, if you can. So is there a simple example of a theory that you one can uh, you can show well posedness through Givray, but it's not would be, would not be well posed through uh, if you require Sobolev. And the uh, other yeah. question is with respect to the shocks in Israel Thor, I'm I'm confused. So if if you if you said that you if you there is a set of initial data that will develop shocks, but wouldn't that kind of mark that the Israel sewer is not working the right way. In principle, the shock would have a very high frequency and Israel sewer is working against it. So I, I'm, I wonder about uh, how that's the result. Yeah, so, so let me, let me so, 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 so your, so your so first question, uh, uh, the answer is yes. Typically, if you take uh, something like, uh, take a hyperbolic operator and you square it, right? So then, mm -hmm. the, the, then if you look at the energy estimates for this guy, it's gonna lose a derivative. Let's say if you take a second order hyperbolic operator, you square, you get a fourth order, right? So for, for you to close the estimate in Sobolev space, you would have to control the solution, uh, let's say in AGS plus three in terms of, in terms of the right hand side in AGS. But uh, because this is, uh, is, a, is a square of operator, you only get the estimates for the, for the hyperbolic part itself. So you would want to only control the solution in AGS plus one in terms of the right hand side in AGS. So, so, that, so for, with that loss of derivative, you see that you cannot close the estimates. So that's not going to be locally opposed in Sobolev spaces. Okay, so okay. that's uh, and, right, that, that's, and that's the whole reason why uh, Gevray came up with these function spaces to try to deal with this kind of degenerate situations. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one exception, unless, unless the right hand side has, let's say, a specific structure. Right, but in general, what I'm saying is, is going to be the best estimate you can get, right? So if the, the right hand side has some specific structure, you might be able to work hard and show that that derivative loss doesn't happen. Now to your question of the singularities, uh, yeah, two two things. First, yes. So if something so if singularity happens, uh, I, I guess it depends on your point of view. Some people might say uh, that that simply means that you know that uh, the physics uh, ran out and uh, maybe that the model at that point is no longer describing the physics. You have to go to microscopic theory or something. But some people might say, no, we know how to deal with singularities even in classical physics. You know, we have the rankine huygenot conditions that tell us how to continue the solution after a singularity and so on. Uh, so I think it depends on what kind of problem you are trying no, to no, solve, yeah. right? Yeah, that, that, I, that I understand, but I, I was, my question is, so is, is, the case that, is it the case that the Israel tour kind of damping of the high frequency for these uh, conditions is not working? So I wonder, if you now yeah, 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 allow that, yourself that, that, to increase the time scale parameter or decrease it, that's, that's a regime of where the, 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 the shock or the, the singularity will happen yeah, shrinks? Yeah, yeah, so, so that, that's possible. So, so let me make one comment for that. So even though I'm motivated this is shock, so when I stated the, 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 the theorem, I was careful to not use the word shock, use the word singularity, right? And that's because, as I said, because our proof is contradiction, by contradiction, all that you can prove that some something goes wrong, but you cannot say that it's a shock. Could be some other singularity, but something goes wrong. I, even though, of course, intuitively we would expect to be a shock. But to your point, that, that's true. So of course, there, there are some assumptions that are not written here. Uh, and everything comes into, you start with a constant state and you make a localized large perturbation. And how large this is depends on the size of the data outside the region that you perturb, depends on the transport coefficients and so on. So yeah, so what I'm saying is like, if you fix everything, right, you fix it tau, you fix uh, the initial point and so on, fix your, fix your constant state, then I can construct some data that's gonna be a perturbation of this constant state in a region for which the solution is gonna blow up in finite time, okay? But that's a, once you fix everything else, so you already fixed your time scales in a sense. Does that okay, make sense? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm, okay, then maybe question by Gabriel and then by Urs and then we. So, so hi, Marcelo. Very, very nice hi. talk. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, I can. So, I have a question regarding just uh, see if I understand qualitatively your, your, your new theory. So, 
from what I understand, you, you now change the concept of a, a gradient expansion, right? So before people, when they talked about a gradient expansion, they always consider only space-like derivatives, right? And in your case, uh, you, you just also consider time-like derivatives. And in this sense, a more general way of, of building the theory. But, but let's say if you take your first order theory as you pose it right now, and you perform a gradient expansion, like mm -hmm. the one Heller, Spalinski, and Yannick did back you know, a few years ago, you also get infinitely many terms of higher order, right? So your theory actually has all terms, right? Right. Right. right and right. do you think those terms are not physical, or, or so for example, if you take the attractor of your theory, which should be highly non-trivial attractor, not just like navier stokes um, is it a physical attractor, or should I only trust it up to first order in the traditional sense? Uh, I, I don't know. You, you probably know the answer to the question better than me, uh, Gabriel. Uh, I, I think that, uh, of course, whenever you see, think of expansion, you, you want to say that if you include higher terms, uh, you should get something more precise, right? On the other hand, there is this business of, you know, uh, at which point uh, you're saying that, that, that uh, the whole underlying philosophy of this expansion is not, no longer applicable, right? So maybe, maybe there are some legitimate non-perturbative effects that you're not going to capture by truncating this at any order, right? Uh, so, so, so I, I don't know. The, 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 my answer is that I don't know. I, I'm interested uh, in a much, let's say, uh, more humble question. Is like, you know, can you can you stay in the framework of Landau, Lifshitz, and Eckert, right? Can you somehow uh, fix this uh, causality and instability problems, right? Uh, and in a certain sense, uh, the even though I motivated thing with this idea of derivative expansion and exactly because of the time derivatives, as you pointed out, I did not use the word gradient expansion, right? Uh, in, in a certain sense, uh, the, the theory uh, should be thought more as like an, an effective field theory, right? So you just write, and that's how you actually arrive at the, the energy momentum test, right? You write the most general expression consistent with some physical requirements in the physics, and then try to see what kind of you no know, uh, constraints are imposed by causality. Uh, so, for example, if you want to tie this with the derivative expansion, uh, it's not clear that the most general case can actually be justified from a derivative expansion. We, we are able to justify that to derive that in the case of a barotropic fluid, right? But in the case with a, uh, with a binary density, we were not able, to, we weren't able to do it yet. So. So what does that mean? It means that to know that uh, uh, the case with baryon density uh, is not arising from some kind of expansion, uh, it somehow should be seen as a resum of the expansion. I, I don't know. I don't know what that means, right? I know that's not a very good answer, but uh, it's, it's right. just something it's that you don't understand. Thank you. And then maybe a question by Urs, I think. Yeah, hi, Marcello. This is Urs hi. from CERN speaking. Um, I, my question, I. I Actually, I think Louis asked it already in, in different ways. I didn't really understand your, your point about these shock solutions, because mm -hmm. at least I perceive them as, strictly speaking, outside hydrodynamics since they come with large gradients and involve microphysics. You have, at least in, even in ideal hydro, you have solutions that lead to entropy increase where there shouldn't be. So there are strong physics interpretations to view them as such. Mm -hmm. So given that you have explored this, just one technical question. You speak a lot of Sobolev spaces, which, mm -hmm. which physicists don't do normally. Um, but is this a condition for a weak differential differentiability um, a constraint on considering such solutions? Yes, because yes. Uh, when I said that the Sobolev function has all derivatives up to a certain order that is square integral, uh, I, I was being kind of a bit lazy. Those are actually weak derivatives, right? Yeah, so but, those are, yeah. But, but I mean, so would a, a proper shock solution be part of the space of solutions you consider? Now, in, in, in general, no, right? In general, to really okay. talk about the shock solution, you want to you wanna look look at uh, what we call the weak formulation of the equations, right? When you yeah. really look at the sort of integral version, you integrate both sides of the equations, right? Uh, so, so, so to that point, uh, yeah, I, I agree that it's quite possible that this sort of singularity are, are, are getting outside the regime 
of uh, where hydrodynamics is applicable, and then maybe try to even ask the question as we do in ideal hydrodynamics, can you continue the solutions with the uh, jumping the entropy and so on, might be a purely academic exercise. Uh, but still, I, I think knowing that the singularities can actually happen can, can at least help you map the space of initial conditions where things can go bad or not. Okay, and that's something you really understand, right? That you, so thank you very much. Conditions and thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're seven minutes over, so we should really also say that there is a break. And uh, I think at 40 past the hour, we'll continue for the next session. But then if people can stay around, maybe it's, well, I don't know, is Amarich just have a short question?